You're listening to the Really Useful Podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Colley and with me is Gavin Phillips. How are you doing, Gavin? I'm doing very well, Christian. I uh, I made some exceptionally good brownies yesterday, so I'm still dining out on that this Monday morning. Okay. The, yeah. How about the, you? Are th- <laughs> sorry, are these legitimate brownies? Oh, they're proper tasty brownies made with multiple types of chocolate, cocoa powder, nice and fudgy in the middle, nice crisp topping. Oh, absolutely delicious. Good oh, good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> um, not, nothing illegitimate about those brownies. That's good to hear. I um, I make brownies from time to time. I'm delighted that they tasteful, tasteful for you, uh, tasty even for you. I um, I make I I have I have a dairy uh, intolerance, so brownies is a bit of a problem for me. But there's this excellent series of books called Bosch, um, which is by some uh, guys who do vegan recipes, which come in very useful. I'm not a vegan. I love a piece of um, steak or bacon or whatever, but uh, a vegan a semi-vegan sort of dairy-free um diet does occur in our house so there's an excellent brownies recipe in one of the bosch books which i made it's kind of like chocolate brownies with peanut butter and raspberry jam on top oh. and it's absolutely fantastic oh yeah i am i am here for that that's incredible <laughs> <laughs> um th- th- now, he's, he's here for that. He's also here to discuss the latest in various tech news that matters. And we've got some tips and tricks. Uh, we are cycling back around, as it were, to the area of open AI and chat GPT in this week's really useful podcast, as there have been some developments in those areas. Uh, so we've got some news, we've got some tips and tricks, and we've got some recommendations at the end. I'm quite pleased about my recommendation. We're going to kick off, though, with something that isn't ChatGPT or OpenAI. It is a scam taking place on Twitter right now. Uh, we have a quote tweet scam that uh, basically bad actors, as we call them, um, hackers, you might call them, uh, criminals is the um, best way to describe them are using quote tweets from so basically uh, say i have a problem with my banking i contact my bank on twitter which is a really stupid thing to do in hindsight really isn't it um but then again many banks close other avenues off so anyway a digression there uh contacting the bank on twitter and wait for response don't get anything then there's a quote tweet so it's not a direct reply to you it's a quote tweet giving you a number to contact or some other means of contacting them and then you know we start getting into the realms of malware ransomware scams um the dangerous quote tweets here's an example the spot account of axis bank notified a twitter user that an impersonator account had commented under one of their posts the user had posted about the 2016 Axis data breach and the fake Axis bank account provided the user with an alleged helpline number in the comments section. This is really sneaky, isn't it? It's really sneaky, yeah. Uh, but you can see how it works. So the, the, the issue here as well is uh, changes made to Twitter uh, since uh, Elon Musk took it over. He overhauled the verification system of Twitter and made it so that anybody could buy verification which gives you the little blue tick showing that you are you know an official verified account the problem is is that the twitter's own verification system for people who are using this uh system uh isn't up to scratch anymore so people are creating false accounts uh perhaps with one letter or one digit changed in the twitter handle but still getting verification and making their account appear as if they were uh, in this case a bank and people are you know understandably falling prey to it gavin who could have foreseen this happening i just i just don't know christian and you know it's mind-blowing for me to say the least (laughs) there's also other things as well i would add as well because um uh, it's been a bit of a tumultuous month already uh where we're mid-march now aren't we uh for banking in general there's been three or four big bank closures in the u.s 
Uh, there's been a big bank takeover as we're recording today in Europe. So yep. a lot of people um, are probably trying to scramble around and find new bank accounts and are running into a lot of issues. So they are trying to contact their banks on Twitter and what have you. Uh, and as Christian has already said, it's definitely not the best way to do it. But sometimes if you're desperate, it's the only way you feel like you can get uh, a firm grasp on at least someone might respond that sort of feeling let's hope so um so basically don't use twitter to contact your bank if you can avoid it and ensure if you absolutely have to ensure it is a legitimate verified account hopefully one that you've used before to contact your bank and if anything replies to it then again ensure it's uh, real legitimate preferably try and use a chat bot i know they're awful uh but you know go on to the bank's website use chat bot if there's a send an email option if you have a business account there's option often the option to send an email from the website so uh, try that as well okay we're going to move into the arena of um chat gpt and then out of it again the way this uh, <laughs> this podcast gonna go so first of all there is a fake chat gpt chrome extension that steals facebook logins why would it do that gavin uh, to steal a Facebook login, it, it literally wants access to your Facebook credentials, doesn't it? Yeah. Access your contacts list. Uh, and as Meta now integrates, uh, sorry, Facebook now integrates uh, payment options, depending oh. on your Facebook configuration, you might have actually saved some banking details yeah. in there or, or other really useful information. I'm sure most of our listeners have seen those posts on facebook where someone's account has been breached and it yeah. posts lots of spam yeah um so that could be one reason behind it but more to the point yeah is that they want the the real the good information which is yeah your, your login credentials uh banking information anything other financial that they could use elsewhere of course that makes sense so um guardio security have uncovered this malicious chrome extension which poses as chat gpt and uh, it hijacks facebook accounts and grants super admin permissions and it has been so far undetected by facebook and google uh guard your security have updated uh subsequently as soon as we reported the f- called phase gpt uh it was removed we're glad to see the quick response to our request uh while thousands were affected many ha- were also saved from having their facebook accounts hacked uh it's quite uh, we, i mean we talked about a, f- a fake windows app for chat gpt last week didn't we and it is i mean there's there's no reason to assume that any of these um, chat GPT and open AI related scams are actually using uh, artificial intelligence or programmed intelligence or whatever to scam people. They're just hooks, aren't they, upon which scams can be held. The latest big thing, always there's a scam about it, isn't there? NFTs is a good example. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I, I couldn't have said it best myself, Christian. It's the latest thing. Whenever there's a big trend, scammers are going to use it to scam and that's kind of all there is to it yeah now we've talked about open ai and uh at length as i mentioned earlier on in previous podcasts but there's been a development uh, uh, with regards to the chat gpt artificial intelligence model it has been upgraded from chat gpt 3.5 to chat gpt 4 hasn't it yeah, so this is uh, this happened on uh, March 14th. OpenAI sort of caught people slightly unaware. So we knew there was a big announcement coming, and most people had guessed that it was probably going to be ChatGPT4, the upgraded model. Uh, but it brings quite a few big changes. Uh, the biggest ones is that it can process a lot, lot more data, and it has uh, many, many more um, points of data that it can draw on. Um, talking like billions more so it's uh chat gpt4 appears much more intelligent than its predecessor chat gpt or gpt3 sorry is the specific name for the model um for those that have used it uh gpt3.5 um some of the answers it can give are quite short uh they can be a bit broken off it doesn't always doesn't always get into the nuts and bolts of uh, a topic, whereas GPT-4, the new version, um, can go the extra mile and really deliver quite impressive detail, even on quite nuanced topics. Um, 
quite interestingly, I was actually playing around with um, GPT-3, 3.5 and 4 last night. I'll just try and pull them up. I was playing the game Assetto Corsa Competizione, and I'm not very good at setting up the, the cars on it, although I like to try. Right. <laughs> so I asked Chat GPT for some tips. <laughs> okay. Thinking, ah, oh, I wonder what it will know. So the, the, the GPT 3.5 gave me a list of five points, which was, you know, focus on aerodynamics, suspension, gearing, brake balance, and tyre pressures. And it gave me 20 words on each topic. Chat GPT um, 4, if I can just switch to the chat, it won't let me switch, gave me 10 different areas. um, And within each of those areas, it broke down specific parts of the car setup that i should focus on to race faster at a specific track that i'd mentioned so rather than just saying you should focus on aerodynamics it said focus on aerodynamics point one the front splitter set it to four point or four or six uh, and then the next point aerodynamics change your rear wing settings to around four to six for a balance between high speed stability and cornering grip and it goes on and it's listed, yeah, 10 different areas to focus on that are very specific to the yeah. car and the setup. Now, it's sort of, that's just one area where you can see the difference between the previous model, GPT 3.5, and the new model, yeah. GPT 4. So, um, yeah, it, it really is quite impressive. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so uh, so that has happened. So next, if you have used OpenAI so far or it's Chat 2 or whatever, um, it's going to be now using Chat uh, or GPT-4 uh, as the... Um, it's, it's essentially a database, isn't it? Uh, it is and it isn't. Uh, it's, it's, a, well, it's a natural language model. So it's been trained on a humongous amount of data and it uses the data that it knows to pre- basically predict what it wants to predict the answers that it thinks it should give um so each of the words that gpt knows is tokenized and it's like an, it's assigned a number basically mm-hmm. uh, and for a very very basic explanation it looks for the patterns within the text that it has been trained upon to predict the likelihood of what should come after each word Uh, and it does that in response to the questions that you ask so it values those numbers or those tokens and creates its own set of tokens to give you the response Um, so it in one sense it is drawing on you know you could call it a database but it's not a database in the same sense of uh, like rows and rows and rows of, of text, if you see what I mean, lines and lines and yeah. lines. Keep that in mind for later in the podcast, dear listener. Now, uh, we talked about Meta Verified a few weeks ago, and they have expanded the rollout of this subscription service, this mind-blowingly stupid subscription service, in the United States. Uh, just to recap, uh, Zuckerberg made the announcement that Meta Verified would be a thing that happens in Instagram and Facebook, and it's basically a sort of Facebook slash Instagram version of the Twitter Verified thing that we mentioned earlier on, where you pay to appear to be more important than everyone else. It's basically it, isn't it? I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's not much more to it than that, is there? Uh, it's also, though, it's Zuckerberg's way of going, oh, look, they've monetized that a bit more. We could do that as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Um, and considering the amount of money that Meta have spent on attempting to force people into the Metaverse, uh, which I think stood at 30 billion dollars the last time i looked at their accounting at the end of last year so they've lost an extraordinary amount of money uh and although monetizing these accounts at what 12 12 pounds a month i think or 15 dollars a month sorry yeah it's not going to make a huge deal of difference it's at that moment where these companies are like oh my gosh we need to get money through the door any way possible (laughs) just imagine if that 30 billion dollars had been used in a useful manner Oh, God, the the pain. (laughs) Food for thought there, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so that's going on with Meta. And also, um, I mean, I suppose it's another 
another loss uh, loss um, thing that they've been uh, throwing down the drain. More money. Uh, Meta have dropped NFT support on Instagram and Facebook after a short trial. Uh, that's something else that we mentioned a few weeks ago. So that's no longer happening now. Um, Stefan Kazriel tweeted on March the 13th that Meta was moving its focus from NFTs to other areas of focus where the company can make an impact. We're winding down digital collectibles, he said, for now to focus on other ways to support creators, people and businesses. Uh, This is part of a five-part thread on the topic of Facebook slash Meta slash Instagram, whatever that whole umbrella, not doing NFTs anymore. They th- he thanked partners who joined us on the journey and stated that we learned a ton that we'll be able to apply to products we're continuing to build to support creators. Let me be clear, creating opportunities for creators and businesses to connect with their fans and monetize remains a priority. And we'll continue investing in fintech tools that people and businesses will need for the future and streaming payments with MetaPay, making checkouts and payouts easier and investing in messaging payments across Meta. So goodbye to uh, the NFTs, but uh, there's still a big portion of um, that sort of whole infrastructure that they're uh, keeping on. Uh, it's not a big surprise, is it, though? Uh, not particularly. I don't think it took off very well. No. Uh, in- Instagram. Instagram particularly has not, never been a massive platform for crypto anyway, has it? It's not a traditional place no, in terms no. of its focus more on lifestyle and, um, and that sort of It's a bit of a misjudgment for Instagram, really, wasn't it? It's like I completely think so, misunderstanding yeah. what the what, what the users use Instagram for. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was to sort of slap it on there for some of the larger creators who may have wanted to do NFT sales and crypto and what have you. But again, yeah, it, it, it misses the point of why people are there to begin with. So yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised this has ended uh, and ended so quickly as well. So, uh, a few moments ago, I mentioned uh, about ChatGPT and uh, with the uh, change from ChatGPT 3.5 to ChatGPT 4. And there's a few differences between them, um, beyond which Gavin has already explained. So, Gavin, can you give us a few of the key differences between these two um, AI models? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, sort of four or five key areas, key differences between GPT 4 and GPT 3.5. Uh, the first one really is creativity. Uh, one of the biggest changes is that um, GPT-4 can actually read images now. So the previous model was purely text-based. Um, now you can give GPT-4 an image and ask it what's going on Ooh. with the image and it can give you a good output uh, and a good explanation as to that. Uh, it's also up to its creativity in terms of its output and responses because it can now draw on a, a larger basis and a larger amount of language. It can express itself better, basically, and which is quite interesting. Um, and leading on to that, yeah, the, the visual element. So one of the one of the things it did, uh, the developers did during the launch of it was show um, GPT-4 taking an image and the, the developer who was demoing the technology um, drew a picture and wrote on it, um, please insert a joke here, basically. Uh, and he drew it as like a mock-up website and he gave the image to GPT-4 and said, output that. And within minutes, it had created a mocked up website complete with a unique joke. Wow. Um, so it can draw upon other language it finds elsewhere, obviously, but it can output more, it can output more creatively um, and more visually as well, which is interesting. Another Another interesting update is the safety. One thing that raised some concerns about GPT-3, uh, 3.5, was that you could quite easily get it to output incorrect answers all of the time, and it would present these answers as if it were fact. Um, and this is actually something that caught Google out when they released theirs, is that it had spat something out as fact and nobody had bothered to fact-check it. Um, because of how confident 
GPT 3.5 and GPT 4R when they output an answer, it's quite easy to go along with whatever they say. <laughs> um, mm. But GPT 4 is now much safer because they've baked many of the safety mechanisms into the model rather than as an afterthought as it was with GPT 3.5. Um, linking to that is the factuality of responses. There's a thing in AI called AI hallucination, which is where basically the AI model um, just makes stuff up because it doesn't quite know the answer. So it basically draws upon anything it can and again spits it out as a factual response. Um, and if you're not paying attention, it can be quite easily to sort of overlook these um, hallucinations. Uh, the final point is the, the context window, which is basically how much data the model can retain during a chat session. So GPT-4 has a much bigger context window than GPT-3.5. So if you're using chat GPT and using GPT-4, to talk you'll be able to go through i can't remember the exact figure but it's a phenomenal amount of uh text before your individual chat runs out of memory which means it can process much more information without you having to um, switch to another chat or if you wanted it to summarize information say you could throw a much larger text at it and it would be able to process and read it much faster rather than having to break it down into smaller chunks. With the efficiency of a Swiss run bank, Gavin, we have reached the recommendation stage of the podcast. <laughs> and uh, you, now you did mention you didn't really have one earlier. Are you ready for yours or shall I um, kick off with mine? Yeah, you can go first, I think. Okay. <laughs> So, here's the thing. Uh, I was having a chat with one of our Make Use Of colleagues the other day, and basically I had to turn down the opportunity to review something because I didn't have a 4K TV, and it made it all a bit bloody pointless. Okay, uh -huh. I think it was an Android TV box or something like that. So I thought, I'm going to have to finally get a 4K TV, aren't I? So I went out and I bought a 4K TV, and by chance, this is like the most... It, it wasn't expensive either. But it's just got such an amazing picture. I've and I was nice. absolutely blown away. But so the last TV I had was a JVC. It was a standard 1080p. I had Android TV integrated, but we never use that because we've got a Roku, so we just use the Roku for almost everything. Um, perfectly fine TV. Only cost it cost pennies for a 1080p TV with smart functionality. Something like I'm going to say 220 pounds, something like that. So around 250 dollars. That's now moved out of the living room and has been replaced by the Samsung Q60B, the 43-inch model, QLED 4K Quantum HDR Smart TV. It is absolutely astonishing how good this television is in terms of picture and also the 3D sound coming out of it. I don't know how the sound is even coming out of it because the, the TV itself is less than an inch thick. I don't understand where the sound's coming from. Fantastic sound. And that's not even one of its main features. Um, so it's just really, really good. I'm so impressed with it. I watched, um, I've been picking up 4K stuff to watch on Amazon Prime mainly. Um, mm. I'd look, I watched the NBA uh, highlights on um, iPlayer. They were in 4K. They looked excellent. And I had a look at, oh, or rather I watched No Time to Die in 4K. And it looked absolutely amazing. Oh, amazing. Was, man, it was a better picture than in the cinema. It's crazy. That's quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've got I've reviewed this for Make Use of it. We're going live in the next few days. It's just a standard written review. There's no video to it. But, I mean, if you're looking for a 4K TV and there is a budgetary issue, and I'd, I'd just recommend it. You know, it's five hundred uh, under £500, so we're in the same sort of like five dollars $600 ballpark area there. There's very, I mean, I bought this from a retailer called Curry's in the UK. I understand from Amazon that it's a bit less than that so it's a very but they don't have this specific model in the usa on amazon but they have other qleds from samsung but yeah i definitely recommend this as a tv it's super really good picture 
That's amazing. I love the fact that you can go and get like a super top quality TV now as well, like off the shelf, and it doesn't cost an absolute fortune like yeah, it once would have. Exactly, been. exactly. I mean, not, not even a couple of years ago, something like that would have been at least twice the price. Oh yeah, definitely. The price of uh, 4K TVs has has dropped significantly. It's interesting as well because you you occasionally read articles or see things about people upgrading to 8K television yeah i was like well that's four times larger in terms of pixels than 4k i was like i don't think people necessarily understand how much of an upgrade that really is it's like it's whopping yeah yeah it's um i mean there's got to be a stage where we have to stop (laughs) absolutely well for now as well um it's limited well at least where i live (laughs) it's limited by my internet connection yeah of course yeah (laughs) And streaming in 4K on a single device in the house means basically nobody else could use the internet. So um, it is a limitation. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, So what's your recommendation, Gavin? My recommendation is, um, as I've been just wondering what I've actually been doing this week, uh, (laughs) always worrying when I get to Monday and go, God, what did I do last week? (laughs) Uh, But I actually spent some time playing a game called uh, Duelist 2, which is a remake um, of, or it's not really a remake, is it? It is a second release, but it's by a different developer of of a game called Duelist, which is a uh, turn-based collectible card game. Uh, It's available on Steam. Um, And the original game, Duelist, was was a great game. Um, There were hundreds of different cards you could win and collect, uh, you unlocked new cards as you went through the game to build stronger and stronger decks, and it had a really, really good online scene. Um, not quite eSport level, uh, but it's definitely competitive, and there were tournaments and what have you. Uh, unfortunately, the game folded, but it has been brought back to life as Duelist 2. Um, it's not quite as good as the original uh, at the moment. They've not released the same amount of uh, cards as the original had but it's quite promising so far Mm -hmm. um so you you basically you get a deck of cards i think it's 25 cards in a deck um and there are six different factions you can choose from you can build cross faction decks there's also an amount of neutral cards that any faction can use along with them and you basically build them up and you battle other people online the board um itself uh i can't remember the exact dimensions let me just one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten by it's a ten by five board uh and you basically place them down place your cards down and then it brings a little like minion onto the board um and you use that to battle uh, the opponent's minions. Uh, there's also like different spells you can cast, uh, and you can create like chain effects between different spells um, to try and take out more people as you go. Um, like I said, it is still under development. Uh, it has been officially released, but they're because of the nature of the game as a collectible card game, they release packs as they sort of make them. So it is right. building up slowly. Um, the best thing is, it's a free-to-play game. There's no oh. actual initial investment. I backed it on Kickstarter because I really liked the original, but if you want to play it, it's completely free. You don't even have to pay any money at all, really. Uh, if you don't want, you can spend zero money it'll take you a long time to build up your card collection but you win a small amount of gold um which you can translate for orbs in game as they're called and the orbs are what holds the cards you get five cards per pack and so on um so it's it's quite good overall um i'll also mention on top of this um if you want to try the original um with all of the cards unlocked there is a website called uh, duelist.gg and that has the original game with every single original card unlocked so you don't have to well I mean you can't go and pay for them anymore because that game doesn't exist but uh, it's a really fun way to see what the original was like versus the new new version 
Excellent. That uh, sounds excellent. We'll give you the uh, link to that in the show notes, along with everything else we've discussed in this week's really useful podcast. A uh, big thanks to Gavin for joining me this week. We'll be back next week. If anything that we have spoken about has proved useful or you think uh, someone you know will be able to benefit from it, then please uh, share it with them. And hopefully our uh, OpenAI slash ChatGPT explainers have helped to uh, open your eyes a little bit about that piece of technology we'll be back next time until then it's goodbye